Hey y'all, welcome to a new week of what's for dinner. To start off this video, I'm gonna be making some chicken teriyaki quesadillas on the Blackstone. So this is about two pounds of boneless, skinless chicken thighs. I just chopped that package up into small pieces, removed any like large pieces of fat, and then I transferred that on over to a gallon Ziploc bag where I added a big spoonful of minced garlic and I measured out about a quarter cup of this teriyaki sauce that I'm just gonna pour all over the chicken. I sealed up my bag and I'm just gonna massage that garlic and teriyaki sauce really well into the chicken. And I'm just gonna let that marinate in the fridge for a couple of hours. I'm also gonna grab a yellow and red bell pepper, get those washed off real good and slice those up into strips. You could also slice up an onion if you wanted to cook that in with your peppers. I did transfer those on over to this little dish for a couple of reasons. For one, it's gonna make it easier to transport outside but also I prep this earlier in the day so fast forward to dinner time I'm going to preheat my blackstone to a medium heat and then I'm going to drizzle on a good amount of some canola oil and I'm just using the back of my spatula to spread that oil out into an even layer now I can go ahead and dump out the chicken as well as those peppers I'm just gonna take my spatula and kind of get all that spread out more evenly. You definitely don't want everything clumping up, especially when you have all of that surface area. But I'm gonna take that same teriyaki sauce and drizzle a little more over top of the chicken as well as the peppers. I'm also gonna go in and season everything with some kosher salt and black pepper. You may think that this chicken doesn't need the kosher salt because teriyaki sauce is definitely on the salty side, but it still does need you know, a little bit of seasoning. We definitely didn't think that it was too salty or anything like that. Everything was really well balanced. So as you can see, I went in, you know, stirred everything up. This all cooks really quickly. Um, so I'm getting everything scooted on over to the left side of the grill where I have the temperature turned down to the lowest setting just to keep it warm. So I don't know if this step was necessary and you probably couldn't tell, but there was a lot of like teriyaki sauce burned to the grill and I didn't want it to like affect my quesadillas. So I decided to do like a quick little deglaze. So I just, you know, squirted on some water, let that kind of steam off. And I'm using my bench scraper to kind of scrape up the hard bits and just kind of shove it back there in the grease trap and I also went in with a paper towel and gave it a quick wipe down. So I definitely needed to go in with a little bit more oil again spreading it out and I have some burrito sized tortillas and I'm going to add down four of those and I'm also going to be using some provolone cheese. I'm just adding um, a slice to each to half of it. Um, I don't know if they make blocks of provolone cheese. I'm sure they do, but I've just never seen it. But that would be super nice or just some shredded provolone cheese. Um, either way, the slices work just as good. But I'm going to start taking the chicken and evenly adding that to the tortillas. It was the perfect amount of chicken to make four quesadillas. And I'm also going to go in with those cooked peppers and add that over top of the chicken. And then I'm going to do a, another layer of the slices of provolone cheese. I also found some sharp cheddar cheese that I had shredded up from another recipe in my fridge that needed used up anyways. So I decided to just pour that over top of them as well. I thought a little extra cheese wouldn't hurt. Um, also worth mentioning, I did turn the temperature down on this side to the lowest setting as well because I did not want to burn my tortillas. I knew that it would take me a bit to get everything assembled. Um, and also when it came time to flip, very easy to do. I just take both spatulas and get those flipped over. I know that when I cook these inside, I like to do quesadillas with butter. It definitely helps brown them. That's the only thing I wish I browned them a little bit more, but I cut those in half, drizzled them with some of this chipotle lime sauce, and I served it with some yellow rice on the side. These quesadillas were incredibly delicious. Love the teriyaki twist to it. Love the char on the peppers. The provolone cheese pairs so well with those flavors, and we love quesadillas anyway ways but it was just something different and it was perfect for a quick weeknight dinner. Next up, we are going to have a steak night. So Kroger had a bit of a sale on their steaks. So I got four strip steaks for $27.70, which definitely felt 
a little pricey to me, but when you do the breakdown, it's about $7 per steak, which you would pay double for that at a restaurant. We rarely do steak nights, so it's all good. I have never done a marinated steak, so I found a good one online that had a lot of great reviews. I really wanted to give it a try, so it's a half a cup of olive oil, a half a cup of some low sodium soy sauce. I will say I felt like this marinade as well was a little bit pricey. It definitely kind of hurt my soul when I had to like discard what was left over. Um, but anyways, I also did a quarter cup of Worcestershire sauce, a quarter cup of some A1 steak sauce. I did um, mince up a few fresh cloves of garlic. I'm doing a teaspoon of some black pepper, two teaspoons of some dried rosemary. It called for two tablespoons of some Montreal steak seasoning, which is what I assumed I had left of this jar. So I just dumped the rest in there. So I'm going to give that a really good whisk. And now I'm going to take those steaks and get those placed into the dish that I want to marinate it in. Once I got those arranged to my liking, I'm going to pour on all of that marinade. Um, probably not necessary, but I'm just kind of flipping those around, making sure everything's nice and coated. And um, I will say, like I did this earlier in the day, I let these marinate in the fridge all day. So about halfway um, through the day, I did go in and flip those on over. Um, but yeah, got those covered up, into the fridge they go. I'm also gonna share a really good macaroni and cheese recipe. I used to make this a lot years ago, and I'm mad at myself for not making it in so long, cause I'm telling y'all, it is delicious. So. To this medium saucepan, I'm melting down a half a stick of butter. I believe this one was salted butter, but you know, anything works. I also added in a quarter cup of some plain all-purpose flour, whisk that together with my silicone whisk and let that cook out for a few minutes. I'm also going in and seasoning this roux with some kosher salt and pepper. You definitely don't want to forget that step because, you know, it's really important in macaroni and cheese. I'm also whisking in two cups of some half and half. The recipe calls for milk, which is what I'm sure I did in the past. That's really good as well, but I had some half and half in the fridge that needed used up anyways, and you just know it's going to make for an even richer and creamier mac and cheese. I really like that in this recipe. Um, so while I was waiting for that to thicken up, my macaroni was done, which I used about eight ounces that I boiled up in some salted water, drained it off, and added it to this grease casserole dish. I did hand shred a one pound block of some sharp cheddar cheese, but I'm just going to be using about three cups of it and I poured it directly over top of that hot macaroni. As you can see, this is the consistency that that sauce should be. It's kind of like a country gravy and you're just going to pour that over top of the shredded cheese, kind of spread it out and that's going to kind of help start to melt it down. Just leave it alone for a few minutes and for the last step, I'm going to make a panko topping, which is just a tablespoon of butter and a quarter cup of just some plain plain panko breadcrumbs and I'm just going to stir that basically toast up the panko until it's golden brown so I had Josh over there on the stove stirring that while I did this step so um, I started off with a spoon but I got nervous that I would break up the pasta so I switched on over to a um, like silicone spatula and basically I'm just stirring it all together making sure that all the pasta is coated in that sauce don't worry too much about that cheese melting down because we are going to finish this off in the oven but once I got that to my liking and kind of smooth out on top I'm just taking my spoon and I'm kind of spooning over that toasted panko topping. You definitely don't have to do this step, but we really, really like the addition of it. Um, my oven is preheated to 325 degrees, and I let this bake for about 15 minutes. So this really is like a quick baked macaroni and cheese recipe, and just look at how creamy and cheesy it is. It has great flavor, and I'm telling y'all, it is like fancy restaurant quality it's the best. So now it is time to cook those steaks. So when I do it indoors, I like to do it in a cast iron skillet. Um, my skillet's on about a medium high heat. I did um, drizzle in some oil and I just did two at a time. I didn't want to overcrowd my pan. 
Now, one thing that I didn't like about the marinade is something in it caused the steak to have a really weird looking sear on it. It kind of burned in some places, which didn't affect the flavor at all, but it just wasn't the prettiest thing to look at. And for me anyways, like when I spend this kind of money, I want it to look really nice. Um, but anyways, when it was done, I just topped it with some butter, um, tended it with some full, and I let it rest for 10 minutes before I served it, which was the perfect amount of time for me to make that delicious looking a asparagus over there on the side. Now, as for the flavor, this marinade was really good. I can see why it has so many great reviews. The flavor really was outstanding, and I did really think that it helped tenderize it. Um, I just don't know how often I would do it because I really didn't like having to pour the rest out, like I said earlier, but um, I would do it again. It tasted great, and it was a delicious dinner. Up next, I'm going to finally make something that I have had on my like to-do list for several years now. Now, soup beans is something that I was raised on. That's not uncommon at all, but I've never done it with dumplings cooked in with it. So, I have a one-pound bag of some dried pinto beans, and I'm just getting those laid out on the counter, and I'm just sorting through those, making sure that there's nothing crazy in there, and just kind of picking out the bad beans. Now, the recipe and inspiration that I am using for this comes from Phyllis Stokes. Um, I'm sure some of y'all know who I'm talking about. She was an older lady here on YouTube who made cooking videos. She has passed away now, which makes me so sad. When I first moved out, um, I would like binge watch her videos. It was like my comfort channel, and she is honestly one of my big inspirations for doing this. So, um, I was really happy to finally make this. So anyways, I have these beans in a colander. I'm giving those a really good rinse and I got those added to my big soup pot. Got those covered with water and I'm just gonna bring those up to a bowl. Um, as you can see, it's not like a really hard bowl, just a simple, you know, easy bowl. And I'm gonna let those cook for 10 minutes and then I'm going to drain off that water and give those another really good rinse. And I didn't show it, but I also rinsed out my pot really well. Then I got it added back to the pot, got clean water in there, and I'm going to repeat this process two more times. And, you know, I will have her video linked in my description box if you want to know her reasoning for all this and, you know, her method. But here's the final cook time. As you can see, the beans have expanded. I've got plenty of water in there. And once I got that brought back up to a bowl, I ended up letting it cook for about another two hours is what it took for my beans to get tender. So now I'm going to get started on the homemade dumplings. She didn't have measurements for this, so I'm just kind of doing it like she did it. So I'm using self-rising flour, and she did sift hers. I don't own a sifter, so I'm just running it through a fine mesh strainer. It really is crazy like how different the flour looks once it is sifted. I rarely sift anything, so that just kind of shocked me. Um, but anyway, she uses some Crisco, and she just goes in there with her hands, kind of scoops out out about a golf ball size amount and you're just going to go in and work that into the flour just kind of like you would when you're making homemade biscuits although when I make homemade biscuits I've always used butter I've never used Crisco but same concept so you're also going to need some buttermilk that's the last ingredient for these dumplings and she said that it should be like a stiff biscuit dough so I'm just kind of waiting for it to feel that way. I'm trying to get better about kind of like filling recipes, if that makes sense, like not having to measure it. Like there is some things I can make without needing to measure it. But when it comes to stuff like this, I do prefer like, you know, set amounts, but I'm just trying to get better at that. Um, I definitely got this a little bit too stiff. I just realized it a little bit too late. Like you're not making pizza dough, Kristen. Uh, but anyways, I just pinch off like small pieces and I'm ro rolling it into small balls. I did put a little extra flour on the side to kind of lightly dust the dumplings. That way it can kind of thicken up the soup beans. So once I started dropping these in, I realized that I forgot to see in the beans first so you definitely want to do that before you start adding in the dumplings but she added in just a little bit of oil um, I think she said vegetable oil but I have canola oil in that container which is 
to me, kind of the same thing. Um, and also some salt and pepper. Now, she doesn't use pepper in any of her recipes because she's highly allergic. That's the only thing that I did different. But she did say to add salt at the end, not the beginning. So in her memory, I did that for this video. Um, but once I got the dumplings added, I added a lid and I let those cook for 20 minutes without lifting the lid. And here is what it looked like as soon as it was done. Now, keep in mind, like as this cools down, um, a lot of that broth will be absorbed. So next time I would add extra liquid because I was left with almost none. But you can't have soup beans without cornbread. So I'm gonna quickly make some up. So I've added four tablespoons of Crisco to my cast iron and I'm gonna let that melt in the oven while it preheats to 400. This is the cornmeal I'm gonna be using. It's a buttermilk cornmeal mix. It has the flour already mixed into it. I measured out two cups. I'm adding in two eggs. Um, I'm also going to need one and three quarters of a cup of buttermilk. I ran out of one carton of that, so I had to crack open another one. But I love a good buttermilk cornbread. When it comes to soup beans, like we don't want a sweet cornbread. We like a crispy, salty cornbread. Um, I also added in a couple tablespoons of oil, and that is it ingredient-wise. So I'm just going to take my whisk, and I'm going to you know, mix it really good, make sure most of the lumps are out. And then I'm going to pull out that hot skillet and get my batter added. So again, like it looks like a lot of oil is flowing over the top and it is, but that's what makes it so good and crispy. So I'm going to bake that for about 25 minutes. To be honest, I could have let it go for another five minutes to let it get a little bit more golden brown on top, but I was in a rush. We had ball games this night and I was pushing time. Um, and then for the last side, I had some frozen okra in my deep freezer. We have never had okra before. It's something I've been wanting to try. My intention was to fry it, but I just didn't have the time and I was cooked out anyway. So I just followed the stovetop instructions on the back. Here is my plate. Um, as for that okra, it tasted really good, but why in the world was it so slimy? Like, if y'all have any tips on how to make it not slimy, I would really appreciate that because again, I love the flavor, but that was a big like no for me, but the cornbread turned out great. The soup beans turned out perfect and I really love the addition of the dumplings in there. Mine came out a little dry in the middle to be honest. It needed more buttermilk, but I would do it again and it felt really great to make one of her recipes. Next up, I made something else that I have wanted to make for a really long time and I have put off because honestly, it really intimidated me and that is fish and chips. If you have watched me for a while, you know I do not cook seafood. So this was a huge deal for me. I was really nervous about it. I absolutely overthought it and stressed myself out about this for a good week. I have probably looked at every recipe that there is on the internet for this until I found the one that I wanted to make. So obviously I'm starting off with the fries. So I have russet potatoes that I peeled and washed and just cut into thick cut like steak fries. I got those covered with some ice water and you want to let those soak for a minimum of 30 minutes. This helps remove the excess starch, making them crispier. And obviously it helps keep those from turning brown. Here I'm making the fish batter, which is a cup of all-purpose flour, a teaspoon of baking powder, a teaspoon of salt. I'm doing a half a teaspoon of black pepper and a quarter teaspoon of onion powder. So got that mixed together real quick. I'm also going to lightly beat one egg before adding that to the flour mixture. And then lastly, you'll need a can or a bottle of beer. Any brand should work just fine. I started with about half of the can um, and I quickly realized that you do need the full amount because I have always heard that you want it to be like a thin pancake batter. Um, so took a little bit of elbow grease to get that flour fully mixed in with the liquid. But um, I did do this in advance. So I've always heard as well that you definitely want your batter to be really cold, as cold as possible. So I'm just getting that covered with some cling wrap and I did set that in the fridge until it was time to make the fish. So here we are with the fish. So I try to thaw this out in the refrigerator. Um, I let it 
you know, sit in the refrigerator for like triple the amount of time that the bag said that it would take. And when it was time for dinner, it was still frozen. Um, I wanted to show y'all the kind that I got, Pacific Cod from Kroger. Got it in the frozen section. I got a family size bag and I just thawed all of it out. So it was a little bit inconvenient that when I was ready to cook it, it was still frozen, but I just threw it in a Ziploc bag and put it in the sink and filled it with cold water and that thawed it pretty quick. Um, so here I am just making sure that the fish is dry laid it out on some paper towels, took another one and patted it dry on top. And then I added a little bit of kosher salt on top. And now I'm taking everything outside to cook because I did not want those smells lingering in my kitchen or in my house. So um, I pulled out the deep fryer. Um, I've got my oil preheated to about 330 degrees and I'm gonna like pre-cook the fries. Um, I let those cook for about three minutes and then I'm gonna take those out. Um, as you can see, they are not fully done yet. You're going to do this um, in like two cooking times. So I'm going to get those drained on some paper towels. Basically, this is just going to like cook the inside of the potato. And um, some grease did splatter on my camera lens. So if that drives you nuts, just know it's equally driving me nuts as well. The little spots on the screen. But now I'm going to start battering up the fish. So I just dusted the fish in some plain flour first. And then I dipped it in the batter, kind of let the excess drip off. And I decided to not cook these in the fryer baskets because I was afraid they would like stick to the wire baskets. So um, I was also kind of worried that it would stick to the metal parts of um, the bottom of that basket. So I kind of like try to hold it in the oil for a few seconds before fully dropping it in. And um, I was really worried about like undercooking the fish since I am so unfamiliar with it. But everything I read said about seven to eight minutes should do it. Or basically just until your batter is like really nice and golden brown. So that's what I did about seven to eight minutes. And as you can see, it is like perfectly golden brown. I did this in a few batches. And after each batch came out, I did dust it with a little bit of of kosher salt so here I am finishing up the last batch. I think that it turned out so beautiful. Um, I was really proud of the way that it looked. Like to me, that is absolutely perfect. Um, and also I forgot to mention that after um, the fries were done, the first round, I did crank that oil up to 370 degrees before I dropped in the fish. So it's still at 370 degrees and I'm gonna finish the fries. So I got those added back to the baskets and I dropped those into the oil for about an another four minutes until those were nice and golden brown. So I'm going to drain those on paper towels and give those a really good dusting of the kosher salt. And inside we went. So I topped everything with some parsley. I've got some lemon to squeeze over the fish. I did make a homemade tartar sauce and a homemade coleslaw earlier that day. And y'all, I was super proud of how this turned out. Hands down, my favorite thing in this video. Definitely one of my favorite meals that I have ever made. This is like one of my go-to favorite orders at restaurants, and I'm telling y'all, this tasted restaurant quality. Um, it was really impressive, super, super good. Highly recommend this recipe. Lastly, in this video, I'm gonna share a fun summer dessert. I'm gonna make a banana split pie. So I have one sleeve of graham crackers. I'm throwing that in my food processor and I'm just gonna pulse that until it is in fine crumbs. I did melt down six tablespoons of butter and I'm just drizzling that in. And I'm just gonna pulse that for a few more seconds just to get that really combined in with the graham cracker crumbs. And I'm just dumping that out into a normal size pie pan and I'm just taking a silly silicone spatula and kind of getting that spread out and I'm just kind of patting it down to form a crust on the bottom and the sides. You definitely want to try and get it as tight as possible so that it will stay together. I always find it best to kind of finish it off with my hands. That will do the best job and as you can see I'm just kind of pressing it up the sides and I am going to set this in my fridge to kind of firm up and cool down while I make the filling. So you're going to need one block of room temperature cream cheese. I did add one cup of powdered sugar to that and I'm going to break out my electric hand mixer and I'm just going to mix this until it all comes together and until it's nice and smooth and creamy. You will need a box of instant banana pudding mix. Now here is where I got a little confused. Um, the instructions to this recipe was a little bit vague here. 
and I just wasn't sure. I was really conflicted. I didn't know if you needed to add the mix like directly to the cream cheese mixture or if you should make the mix with the milk like it says on the back of the box and then add it to the cream cheese mixture. I even tried to reach out through email to the person who wrote this recipe. I haven't heard nothing back yet, but I don't know. It just felt kind of wrong to do it the way I did it, but I did it because um, I just didn't see how all these layers could fit in this little pie pan. So while it was delicious, I do think it needed the milk to be added because it was a little bit too sweet and um, it was a little bit gritty, kind of like it would be biting into sugar. But anyways, I covered it with cling wrap. I let it sit in the refrigerator for like a day before I finished it off. Um, and then I just did a layer of bananas and a layer of some drain crushed pineapple. Obviously, I didn't drain it good enough because I could see some of the pineapple juice kind of piling up. So you know, I make lots of mistakes. I'm human, y'all. But I just kind of tilted the pie pan, drained that off some more, and it turned out just fine. Um, I did a layer of Cool Whip, and I also took this jar of hot fudge, and I microwaved it to make it easier to drizzle. And I'm just doing a few tablespoons of that and just kind of, you know, trying to make it pretty on top. And I'm also going to take some of these like chopped walnut pieces, sprinkle that all over the top. And then lastly, I'm going to hit it with some of these like just jarred cherries. And I think that looks super pretty. Um, looks delicious. Like this would be perfect to bring to a summer cookout. Um, I wanted to make sure to cut into it for y'all so you can kind of see the inside and the layers. Um, while I probably made some mistakes, it still turned out really delicious. We really enjoyed it and it's definitely worth sharing with you guys. So um, if you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I definitely stepped out of my comfort zone a little bit. Um, pat myself on the back for that one. But yeah, I hope that all of you have a great rest of your week and I will see you guys in my next video.